Welcome to episode 69 of Triton Cast. This is the podcast for UC San Diego Athletics, and we're pleased to be joined by our guest today, Arya Borkov, class of 1995. And we'll get into your career and, and why it's so beneficial for us to have you here today. But let's start at the beginning. And why did you choose to come to UC San Diego as a student? Well, thanks for having me. Um, and uh, I should say I'm, I'm joined here uh, with for, for moral support here by my, uh, my college uh, roommate, uh, Dave Fields, who's actually class of 96. Um, I know it was, a, it was a struggle. Um, <laughs> uh, Jim Gretner uh, and uh, Brendan Hyde, who, who made it out on time. Um, but uh, yeah, we uh, we stayed in touch and they're here with with me today, which is great. Um, but um, well, I, I had a residency. Um, I, I was actually in Baltimore in high school. And um, I had uh, my mother moved to California while I was in high school. And um, actually had residency in California, even though I was living in Baltimore. And so I thought, um, you know, UC education, tuition free at the time, and uh, probably best in class. And, uh, and why not go to um, San Diego? Because I thought, uh, and I looked at all of them, but I thought San Diego would be like the most interesting, had the most promise, you know, what was then a situation that looked like uh it was static. I knew it would not be um, the same, you know, five, 10, 20 years from now. And, uh, but, you know, I, I really didn't think about the weather and all those other things. I thought about it just being um, a great place to study. And, um, and I decided um, that would be the spot, not the, the conventional UCLA or, or Berkeley uh, or others that were also beautiful, but San Diego was, was the one that was most in motion. So tell us about some of your favorite memories and your time here as a student. Well, it took me a little while to get acclimated. To be honest with you, like um, if you looked at my GPA, I think for the first quarter here, you probably thought English was my second language. <laughs> uh, you know, it, because not because I wasn't um, studious. I mean, I come from a family of academics. It was incredibly important to everyone uh, in the family and and to myself to excel academically. Um, but I also wanted to make sure I had to write the right balance and understood a new area. I didn't know anyone at all on campus didn't know anyone in the San Diego area. Um, I was not in California for such a long time. Uh, having been born in Palo Alto, I had not uh, come back here for a long time. So I was trying to get acclimated. Uh, and I really count on like my friends here um, and our little tight community. Um, at that time, we were in Muir College within a school of 15,000 people. And that was the pitch that you could sort of go home at night to your quad and your area and your community even though you were in a big university, now it's even more important because you're, you know, triple the size, forty-five thousand people almost, and having your community as a basis of support and comfort while you're existing in a in a in a world that's much larger is a great metaphor for life. And so I I I really used sort of the inside outside to um, to come back and have a, a great balance and a great social life, and also um, you know the more comfortable I got, the more I felt like I could excel in different areas. Did it take you some time to settle in? I mean, being away from home and, and finding that community and developing those friendships? Um, the friendships happened right away, um, uh, which, was, uh, which was natural and, um, and sustained, you know, almost 30 years later, 25 years later, which is great. Um, but taking time to feel comfortable academically and taking time to figure out the program that I want to study and taking time to figure out the neighborhood and how to navigate the campus and the surrounding San Diego areas. Yeah, that took time. Um, but it starts with like where you can create your community of trust. And that for me has always built a level of security and confidence. And then that doesn't create a ceiling, that creates a floor. And then you can keep moving from there. And you majored in economics while you were here. What was your intention when you graduated in terms of career? What were you hoping to do? Well, I didn't, I was kind of nervous. I mean, when I, uh, when I, when I was, Senior, a senior at school here and you realize that like the end is near and you're going to go out to the real world and um, you start to assess you know what your competitive skill sets are and if you're in pre-med or if you're in engineering or in other vocations that lead you right into a, a profession it may be a little bit have more clarity around it but when you're in economics you know in one hand the world's your the world's your oyster on the other hand 
it's not clear where you're going to go afterwards. And so you're going to jump into some unknown. And, and I didn't in, in any way think that the San Diego area was going to be my geographic home. So that created a sense of launching out. Um, and then I thought to myself, well, what, what does economics prepare you for? It could be anything. And so then you have to start making some choices and narrowing it down. And I narrowed it down to, you know, if you wanted to do finance and if you wanted to be trained um, and getting skills that would help you um, level set with the rest of the world, you know, Wall Street was a great place to do that. Uh, there were others. And and I didn't feel like being on the fringe of Wall Street was the right place to start. If you're going to be on Wall Street or in Wall Street, go to the capital, which was New York. And so that created a whole level, level of competition. And I realized that kind of early on in my senior year, and that it created an energy. So obviously with the time difference, I would get up in the morning, like probably four in the morning, and um, and I would dial for dollars and try to get onto programs. And I felt like once I got into a program, um, then I would be like everybody else around the world and have a, ch- a chance like everyone else would have a chance. And that was that was hard. That was difficult. Yeah, I'm sure it was. So when you got to New York, what was that adjustment like living in such a big city and again away from home and so on? Well, when I when I we graduated on a Sunday, I think I was in New York on a Monday. Oh, wow. And I had a job interview with Oppenheimer because I want I really wanted to get into equity research. I wanted to be a specialist, not a generalist. A generalist would have taken me to the investment banking route. That was the only choice I remember making. A specialist would have taken me to research. So I wanted to get into research, and I thought whatever field I landed in in research, I would just stick with it, and for the rest of my life, that would be my expertise. And with the passage of time, people couldn't take it away from you. And so I had an interview the first day. Uh, it just happened to be on that Monday after I graduated with Oppenheimer with a guy who covered the oil and gas industry. And I thought, wow, life is good. You know, like um, the karma is happening where – finish on a Sunday, I get there on a Monday, I'm going to get a job, I'm going to be an oil and gas research analyst at Oppenheimer, and then my career is going to start, and it's going to be amazing. And I got there on Monday, um, and I uh, had a great interview. And um, at the end of the interview, um, I thought I had it nailed. I thought life was all in sync. And um, and like it happens to everybody, I mean, he, you know, the, the, the person that interviewed me, and I've talked about this before, really just... Um, you know, kind of, uh, you know, strung me along a little bit. And then I, uh, I, I, I kind of returned his call and called again afterwards and he never really responded. So I never got that job. And then you found yourself in New York with no job. So everything that you thought you had synced up and, 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 uh, and, and kind of packaged up is now just in New York starting again, just like I felt like I started in San Diego with no one. You're now you're in New York with nobody and your bank accounts draining and then you say, okay, well, am I going to stay here? I'm going to go somewhere else. And then you decide, if you're gonna, are you going to go backwards or are you going to stay moving forward? And I didn't really believe in being backwards or neutral. So I said, well, I'm going to stay here and look for a job. It took me about four months to look for a job until I, uh, I, I said I did everything but put resumes under windshield wipers. So like, I went around and you know just hustled. And, um, and I felt like I should be hustling. You know, like I had no reason to think that anything was going to be given to me. So I hustled. And I... I felt like I I, inter, I I encountered a lot of people saying, you're in New York, it's cold, the winter's coming, and you just left La Jolla, California. There's no way even if we gave you a job, you're going to stay here. You're going to go back to La Jolla, California. I'm like, no, I promise I'm not going back. <laughs> I'm like, I have a lot of great memories about San Diego, but here I am. But I, I really felt like, um, you know, you have to be in the, uh, in the capital, in, in the center of things to make it happen. So let's fast forward um, a couple of decades. So you're at UBS. And in 2012, you leave to start Lion Tree. Was that nerve wracking when you made that decision? And how did you go about starting a company from scratch? Yeah, I mean, my when I, I loved my time at UBS. My first start, I should say, was at Smith Barney. When I finally got that four months in, I got Smith Barney, and then and then actually Oppenheimer, and then and then UBS for 13 years. And it was a great experience at UBS. And uh, in a lot of ways, I thought I was going to continue on continue on there and keep moving. And then you realize, you know what happened, actually, if you actually look at your iPhone, whoever's listening in, there's a little thing that you can do that was became clear to me around 2010, 2011, that if you look at your contacts in your iPhone and you go to your contacts app 
On the right-hand side, it says A, B, C, D, F, G. On the bottom, it has a pound sign. If you hit the pound sign and scroll to the bottom, at the very bottom, it tallies your contacts. Yep. But most people don't look at that, and people are probably looking at it right now if they're listening. And, you know, the CEO of UBS told me about that in around mid-2010, and he had 4,480 contacts. And I said, wow, that's amazing, incredible. And he was just showing me that a global CEO of a major bank, you know, what 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 his reach was. And when he left my office to look just myself, because I don't want to embarrass myself, I don't want to embarrass him, I looked at my contacts, and I had uh, nearly 20,000, which is not normal. Yeah, that's a lot. Uh, not normal. No, I've never seen anyone that had those contacts. I just, you know, I can't... Um, shed people too easily so no no I, I mean i enjoy the community building right so um and i thought to myself right away at that point there's a choice do you continue in one organization and move into management and thereby a kind of abandoning these external constituents or do you pay all your attention to these this community of people that you've 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 uh, garnered trust and support with your entire life and do you have to build a new skyscraper for them to house and that created this feeling of anxiety of sort of, um, do I stay or do I go? And um, But it was energizing also because, you know, you, once you have something in your mind, you can't escape it. You have to address it. And um, and I had no problem, given these other stories we're telling about, jumping into the unknown. I, I actually liked jumping into the unknown as long as it was a reasonable decision. So I felt like, you know what, nothing wrong with UBS, but the time had come to try to, like, put this new chapter in place. And then the energy of Lion Tree became who can take care of these contacts and these relationships with me and build something together and build something new. Just because something existed in the past doesn't mean that they're going to stay that way. And I'm a big believer in the insurgency of what can be built today can potentially replace what the establishment looks like today and can be replaced those companies tomorrow. And that is a governing sort of philosophy uh, of the energy of just why not? Why can't you build it? And so I thought, obviously, at that point, just do one deal. And then if that goes well, you'll do another deal. And you can't promise sort of like the grandiose vision. But I felt for sure, if you do the things the right way, if you do the right things, you'll end up in the right place. And so, but yeah, when I left UBS, to your question, my knees buckled. I wasn't sure, but that lasted about 30 seconds. And then you find things that give you confidence to keep moving forward. And so as you started lion tree and you're working on that first deal was there ever a point where maybe you did glance over your shoulder and wonder perhaps should you have stayed or were you always you were good with that not me um i felt like if i was if lion tree could have failed but that doesn't mean that i was going to go back to where i came from i would have started something else um i didn't really believe in kind of going backwards um, once you made the decision to jump, then it's a forward looking view, whether it's Lion Tree or something else. And um, I felt like, um, you know, if you have that luxury, obviously, but I, I would have done something menial also. Like, it doesn't mean you have to do Lion Tree or something else that's, um, that's grandiose. I mean, I felt like Lion Tree in my head was the right move to start a bank, a merchant bank that's the most classic form of banking, you know, created in the 16th, 17th centuries. But in this case, for an innovative, dynamic economy where all classic industries, whether it was software or retail or education or media or finance, was all moving towards an innovative state with rapid fire uh, progress. Why not create a bank for the digital economy? Why not create a bank around these relationships that were all fast moving? And, you know, why not me? And so you have to start building a team. And I thought... If you could just do one or two deals and establish your reputation in the right way and then look at things afresh, then uh, there's always room for that. So you, at LionTree, you've helped uh, broker some major media deals nationally, internationally. How do you find clients? Or at this point, are they coming to LionTree? Um, it's a community. I mean, it's a, if you do the right thing, people will find you. It, you know, I'm always, I have enough room in my life for people that, uh, interest me that I'm curious about um, in new in, in new areas. Um, I never feel like we're sitting around anything that's sedentary. So, um, and obviously, if you if you announce a transaction that's successful or high profile, um, people are interested in what you're doing. And 
and I'm, I'm looking at your value and mission statement here at UC San Diego, we believe in um, transformations, not transactions. So the transactions that we do come out of thinking about how things will be in the future. And ideally, we announce deals that are more transformational in nature, which is to say it changes the way people think. So when we did the MGM Amazon merger representing MGM, that was the only deal, the first deal where a content studio merged with a technology company. And that led people to think about, well, do other technology platforms need content? And we didn't do it because we thought this is going to change the world. We, but we thought didn't have to be the, the mergers didn't have to be done the way they used to be. And there's a, a rationale for Amazon and Amazon Prime to have access to high quality content, James Bond, et cetera, House of Gucci, other other creativity that they didn't have access to on a leased basis. They had to own it. And so if if your rationale is correct, and there's a lot of market reasons why you could be wrong, and you'll know why you're wrong. But if you keep moving forward and you move down the field and you're right, then you have an obligation to go get to the optimal. And then the announcement of that will then change the landscape. And then people will come to you, you'll come to them, but it just changes the discourse. You're, you're still in the game. You're still talking about it. That's so interesting. We're chatting with Arya Burkhoff, class of 95, here on this episode of Triton Cast. So the name Lion Tree, where does that come from? Well, I always like to think about... Um, the name belongs to everyone else. So like I, I didn't, uh, I didn't, uh, I wanted lion to be something that was, um, forward moving, um, you know, king of the jungle, ferocious, et cetera, but juxtaposed with the fragility of nature and the tree and, and the tree itself is one that has very strong roots into the ground in order to grow to the sky, which is a bit of a self-corrective dynamic. And, um, a lot of people want to grow and focus on the top of the tree, but you'll topple over unless you figure out the uh, the real structure and engineering of the roots. Um, and then REA, for those that know, means lion uh, in Hebrew. So like, I want to identify with it, but I didn't want anyone else to feel that they were um, that they were that it was mine. I wanted it to belong to everybody else. But I had I had real reasons why the names belong together, and I think over time, hopefully, people will think about lion tree and just the name Lion Tree. I always say, what does Goldman Sachs mean? There were two people, Goldman and Sachs. Right. Marcus Goldman. I forgot the first name of Sachs, but there are two people. But now over a long period of time, and I'm not comparing Lion Tree to Goldman Sachs. Obviously, Goldman Sachs has been around for a long, long time. Over time, people just think of it as their own. Yeah, you stop wondering at some point where yeah. it came from and it just it just flows. Correct. So tell us a little bit about Kindred Media and, and why that was started and what was the purpose. Kindred Media is, um, there's a, what Lion Tree does, first of all, and I'll get to Kindred is, um, for those of people who are thinking, like, why is Lion Tree sitting, in, you know, on top of our arena or with our arena? Like, what is Lion Tree? Uh, my answer to that is it's much better than Remac to start with. So right off the bat, you're, <laughs> you're, you're better off. Um, but we'll, get, <laughs> we'll get to sports in a second. But, like, uh, but, like, um, but Lion Tree is a, a private company. But Lion Tree does um, a few things. We do mergers and acquisitions of companies in the media, communications, technology areas, but broadly speaking, anything that's innovative or transformational, and which we think is everywhere, education, retail, food, agriculture, financials, media, et cetera. We also do capital markets. So we take companies public, um, like any other bank, and then we invest as a, uh, as a private equity or a merchant bank or a venture capital investor. But we do it without taking control for ourselves. We try to facilitate the entrepreneur's vision and dreams by allowing them to be in control of their destiny. So that's what a merchant bank is. We also believe that with all the different uh, conversations we're having that are all private and discreet, that you pick up some perspectives about where the world's going. And it's all our, our obligation to express back to our community what those messages are and that's kindred that's kindred our family our people and what does the platform say what are what's everyone saying to each other how do we want to facilitate what one person is doing versus another so like when roe v wade was turned over uh, and then there was a lot of tumult like live nation is one of our you know, key constituents um and clients and friends you know had something where we highlighted the fact that live nation to their employees said to them if you want to protest today and you get arrested we will bail you out and so we kind of just highlighted that 
and we're not highlighting one side or the other, but we'll, if we think something's interesting or not normal or not conventional, we'll highlight that as part of our Kindred Media platform, and we'll do our own podcast and tell the stories uh, elongating where we came from to where we're going, and um, and we'll just, it's just an expression tool based on the different perspectives we pick up um, you know, around the world. That's so fascinating. Let's bring it back to UC San Diego. So you're at Lion Tree. UC San Diego Athletics is competing in Division Two, but there's some rumblings about maybe perhaps wanting to move towards Division One. And you were instrumental in spearheading that momentum on campus. Why was that important to you? Um, well, look, everything is about why not. Um, if you feel something is not situated properly today, or it's not just about a challenge that has to be overcome, but also something that's not optimized, you know, go for the optimization, go for par excellence, go for progress, go for growth. And even being here at UC San Diego, I felt like the university was a growth stock. It was completely in motion and what was going to be, you know, today, 25 years after I was here, or I was just talking to Dave, 25 years from now, you know, what will, what will look like it's changed where if you look, if you look at um, the top 10 stocks in the Dow or the S&P 500, they're completely different than they were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. But if you look at the top 10 universities in all these rankings, they're kind of similar. And I thought that, well, that shouldn't be the case. So I believe in the energy of a university cracking through based on what they can give to their student body, give to their faculty, and give to the broader ecosystem. And UC San Diego is, you know, a public, affordable university that gets so many applications that is in growth mode and obviously getting a tremendous amount of capital from around the world to continue to put things into the campus. And you can see it everywhere you go. And that's all about academics, reputational value, research, and obviously world impact. But that's all like your mind. And I feel like for things to really travel, you need your heart. And your heart has everything to do with brand, spirit, emotion. And uh, and I felt like, you know, when we were here um, with Dave and Brendan and and, my, and, uh, and Jim, we were always saying like, man, if we had like a sports team, once we left the, the years that we were here, we would still connect. And we wouldn't just connect with each other. We would connect through the university and through the, the athletes. People are fans of the New York Yankees because it's a brand. The players move over every single year or every few years. It matters about the brand itself. So I think UC San Diego is a brand. And it's a, the brand takes off with a feeling and the brand affinity. And that takes off mostly through uh, sports, in my mind. So when I heard that, that we were thinking about going from D2 to D1, I jumped on it because we were, we were always talking about it. And, and I also didn't feel like it was in any way sacrificing like academics for, you know, athletic excellence. You could have both. And I think that's proven out so far um, where we have a lot of student athletes and so on. But, but to me, it was a no-brainer, and it would allow us to be uh, accelerating at an exponential pace the value of UC San Diego. So three, mil three years ago, you made a $5 million gift to support athletic scholarships. It's the largest uh, gift to athletics to date. Why did you make that move? Well, for the reasons we talked about, I mean, it's like kind of a, it's kind of, you know, you want, when you invest in something, you want to invest in something that's going to have growth um, beyond today uh, and investing in, in UC San Diego overall and investing in UC San Diego sports, um, especially just that we're knocking on the door now, just having got to D1. So you have a lot of levers of growth at the same time, the university's growth, population of the university's growth, applicants growth, the impact on the world's growth, the brand's growth, and sports. Um, now we just have to start winning. It would be great. And then all those things will happen, and, uh, and that'll be a great investment. But I, I, I would do it you know, all over again. I mean, I think just getting going here um, will attract a lot of attention uh, around the world. And I think, I think it's a great division. It's a great location to play. I don't know why we wouldn't attract the best student athletes in the country maybe in the world, to come play here. So to me, it's a, it's a no-brainer. We talked about it 25 years ago. Well, we certainly appreciate it. I know that you recently wrapped up time as a co-chair on the campaign for UC San Diego, which was wildly successful, raising over $3 billion. 
Why do you think that campaign was so successful? It's the most amount of money raised for uh, the youngest university, um, which is which is exactly tells you that there's a lot of interest and attention uh, far and wide. I think there's a lot of international people and institutions that donate into the program as well and the campaign. Uh, and people are watching what's happening here. Um, it's a uh, it is a it's a public accessible institution that has best in class academics. And when I was here, economics was further down the pro the program. Now you have computer science and biology and economics and psychology and social sciences, um, all the top of the funnel for majors, which is very diversified and has great potential for careers and professions across a wide spectrum and, and best in class faculty. And when you add the uh, spirit of the athletics and the campus beauty and the surrounding areas beauty and all the things that are growing on campus and the, the construction here, um, then the best is yet to come. So to me, it's an easy, it was an easy call. We, we went out to raise $2 billion, raised $3 billion, and um, you'll see the effects of it on campus right away. So we're here this weekend to celebrate the public unveiling of the Lion Tree Arena name. Uh, you and family and friends back on campus this weekend. How much has campus changed since you were a student? It's it's changed a lot. I mean, we were touring around today. I like seeing all the new areas of campus, uh, like the amphitheater and the light rail. Um, but I also like seeing the older areas, um, like the uh, your, your college hasn't changed that much actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Tanaya and Tayoga hasn't changed that much. Uh, the engineering, um, the house hasn't changed that much. So the seven virtues and seven uh, vices hasn't changed that much. So like. I like that's all, that's what we're all about. Like, what is classic and what is innovative, and how you bring it all together. So I like seeing both, but it's yeah, it's vast. I mean, it's vast, and it's uh, it's just a great place to be. Uh, it's energizing. Um, so, but I hope hopefully the campus is also getting more fun because when we were here, it was like very serious <laughs> all the time, except for our community. Um, so hopefully, it's a good balance of fun uh, while people are here, and spirited, and obviously. Um, situated well academically and vocationally as you get into the world. And we all need a lot of help right now uh, to overcome our challenges. But but I run right towards those things to see if we can create that insurgency. Well, that's part of the, the growth of this campus, right, is having more and more students living on campus and ha making it more of a residential campus than certainly than when you were here. Um, so that can help with that cause. Yeah, I mean, I was talking to the chancellor today. He said that his view is that 60% of... Um, all housing should have an ocean view. And I was like, well, you know, that's like a luxury of life. Like, don't take that for granted. You know I mean? I, I think uh, it's a beautiful thing, but therefore we should have like the most excellent, best in class students, best in class athletes and student athletes here um, because that is a total luxury. Um, doesn't have to be that way. I mean, you take the weather here for granted. Um, but I, I sort of like look at that and put it on the side and say, okay, there are a lot of other reasons to be here besides the ocean view, and uh, and it's everything that is um, being put into creativity and the craft center as sort of like the blood in the veins of the place versus just um, science. Both go hand in hand. I mean, to put humanities and artificial intelligence together and ethics and science together, I mean, that cross-pollination of all those things is what really is interesting about the, how the world really works. Well, certainly we in athletics and UC San Diego as a whole are grateful for your generosity, and it's so nice having you on campus. Thanks for joining us on TritonCast, Arya. It's great being here, and uh, I hope uh, I hope we uh, have a great D1 experience. I'm sure we'll never go backward, only forward, and it's great to have uh, all my friends here together with me and the family here together with me, and it's also created a new bond for us all to come back and not only not only watch it here physically in the arena, but also to uh, be able to watch virtually uh, as the uh, as more and more broadcasts and more and more streaming picks up our games. It'll be a lot of fun to be rooting for it rather than these other adopted teams we took on over time. Awesome. Thank Thanks you. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it.